Welcome back to week four of the Whole Food Masterclass with Jeremy Wellness. Love yourself enough to feed your body good food. Remind yourself of how worth it it is to feed yourself good food. You are definitely worth it and love yourself enough to do that. My name is Tara Joseph. I am a Whole Food Nutritionist. And tonight, we are talking about everybody's favorite topic, gluten-free baking. Let's recap, though, the goals that we have made so far. This is week number four, so the goal list is growing. I want you to get out your diet logs if you have been doing those, and get out a pencil, and let's do those first. So look at your diet logs and circle anything that has obvious sugar. Any kind of foods that you had in the past week, sugar in your coffee, soda, sweet tea, anything like that that's got obvious sugar. Hopefully your pencil or pen is not moving. All right, the next thing I want you to circle is any refined carbohydrates that's not from fruits and vegetables. That's from those box things like pasta bread, crackers, that you ate more than a half a cup of or whatever your goal is. So everybody's doing this at their own pace and I commend you for going at a pace that you know you can you can sustain and accomplish. So if your goal last week was a, a cup of refined carbohydrates, then anything over a cup. All right, circle those things and know that that is your homework for this coming week. Those are really the two things that you've got to knock out of your diet. So keep working at getting rid of those if you have anything circled on your diet log this week. Hopefully you're 100% and you've gotten rid of all of that stuff. Remember, you can always get the Janima from the office if you need it to get rid of the sugar. All right, if you've reduced the carbohydrates to a half a cup, Start switching to things like buckwheat, quinoa, and brown rice. They have some nutritional value and a lower glycemic index, so they're not going to affect your blood sugar as much as other things like white rice and white flour is going to. Six half cut, cup servings of vegetables every single day. The closer to raw, the better. So if you can put in a salad in there, some raw veggies that you snack on while you're making dinner, that's really great. We already talked about the sugar. Drinking half your body weight in ounces every day. And then if you're drinking any kind of caffeinated drink, an extra cup of water for every cup of caffeinated drink. And then the last thing is if you're exercising, make sure that you're having at least one cup of water for every 15 minutes of moderate exercise that you're doing or to whatever you feel like you need. All right, exercising 15 to 20 minutes per day. That's not a whole lot. Anybody can do that. You don't need to be changed what clothes you have on. Write down what you're eating, tracking your progress either in an app or on a piece of paper, shopping without a list, and cooking without a recipe. Those last two are optional. If you have a system that works for you, then by all means, keep on doing that system. If you're doing this program to lose weight, a healthy weight loss would be considered a half a pound to a pound a week. So we see all those advertisements when you're at the checkout line in the grocery store, lose 10 pounds with a super diet in the next week. And that is not a healthy weight loss. You want to do something that's going to come off and stay off. So this is what you can expect. But consistency is the key here. So every pound is 3,500 calories. And you have to make some kind of deficit either in your diet or by creating a deficit through movement. So 3,500 calories sounds like a lot, but it's actually not that big of a deal. If you walk for 15 minutes, that's 15 minutes extra of walking or movement every single day, for the next year and you weigh 150 pounds, you would lose 10 pounds. That's all you had to do is walk 15 minutes every single day. You didn't have to do anything else. That's pretty spectacular. You just have to be consistent with it and not give up on yourself. Then let's say you do something else. For example, you get rid of um, those empty calories and things like pretzels and crackers in the evening when you're making dinner. I know that's my downfall when I start to snack and I'm super hungry. 
So you grab some veggies instead, and you've just now knocked out another good 200 calories from your diet. That's 1,400 calories, close to half a pound every single week, just with a little bit of tweaking and a lot of consistency. The flip side of this is, if you cheat on the weekend, you can turn this back around really quick. So you go to Starbucks and you get some latte that's 450 calories and then maybe you go out and you even have a couple of drinks so you go out to dinner and you have dessert you just put the half a pound right back on again so consistency is the key there i want you to stay focused on where you want to be looking and feeling great imagine the body that you want to be in and how you want to be feeling Every night before you go to bed, close your eyes and just focus on that image. And that will actually hardwire your brain the next day to focus on things that you should be doing to make that happen. And you start actually feeling and becoming the person that you're imagining. And before you know it, you're there. Okay, some things in life call for cake. And this program is really meant to be a lifetime change for you, something that is sustainable. And I think we've all found ourselves in that situation where we've been on this strict diet and you turn up to somebody's birthday, or it's your birthday and somebody's brought you cake, and it's an awkward moment. You, you know, you have to say no, or you eat it and you feel bad about yourself. There are special occasions in your life that cake is called for or some kind of delicious sweet treat, go ahead and use it in that isolated moment. Enjoy the occasion, eat whatever it is you want, and then the next day get back on the bandwagon and go back to healthy eating. So one piece of cake is not going to kill it for you. In fact, if you enjoy those things on occasion, once a month or less, then you will find that you'll be able to sustain this type of eating plan for the rest of your life because of that flexibility. So give yourself a little bit of flexibility in what you're eating. But we can definitely make those baked products better for you by getting rid of the gluten. So why is gluten bad? This is a big, you know, everybody says, well, you know, why, why do we need to get rid of gluten? Well, eating gluten creates a lot of inflammation, especially in your gut, creating digestive issues. And because your gut is a big part of your immune system, it leads to other problems as well, especially when it comes to immunity. So if you cut out the gluten from baked products, you can reduce the inflammatory process in your digestive tract when you eat them, and you can create things that taste just as good as they would have if you had gluten in them. Tonight we're talking more about the gluten sensitivity than celiac disease, which is an autoimmune response to gluten itself. But both things we have seen rise over the last 50 years. 50 years ago, nobody heard about gluten sensitivity, and now it seems like every kid you meet has some kind of either food sensitivity, whether it's gluten or something else. And a big part of that is because of the GMO products that we now have in our food system. It's not the only reason, but it's definitely one of the culprits. And the thing with gluten is that wheat is sprayed with glyphosate after it's been harvested as a desiccant to the plant so it doesn't pick up and stays nice and dry. And Although the wheat itself isn't a GMO product, it's getting a lot of glyphosate on it, which is causing gluten that was already irritating to the gut that much worse. All right, so let's talk about how we're going to get rid of it. But first, remember, just because it's gluten-free does not mean that it's healthy. We see all this stuff in the grocery store, gluten-free cookies, gluten-free cake, gluten-free crackers. And a lot of times the organic gluten counterpart is better than the gluten packaged stuff that you're seeing at the grocery store. And here's why. 
in the package stuff that's the gluten free, there's also always some other kind of ingredient in there that you don't really want to be eating. Things like canola oil you want to watch out for, that's in a good majority of the gluten-free baked goods that you're finding at the grocery store. Corn starch, potato starch, and hydrolyzed protein. So the first thing, three things, the canola oil, corn starch, and potato starch are all GMO products. So remember, genetically modified organisms spray with the glyphosate, create gut permeability and digestive problems over time, just like that gluten, although the gluten gives you more of an inflammatory response immediately, depending on your level of sensitivity to gluten. So both not so great for you. And then hydrolyzed protein, that's a tricky one. Hydrolyzed protein is the cousin of MSG, and food manufacturers put it into um, different products as an additive to enhance flavor. But instead of saying MSG, they can say things like hydrolyzed corn protein. And you see corn and you see protein, and you think, okay, I know what those mean. But hydrolyzed, you don't really understand what it means, so you just kind of skip over it and you think that it's okay, when in fact, it's not really a natural product anymore because of the way it's been processed, isolated out of nature, and it becomes a food additive that's not really good for you. And typically, it's coming from things like corn and soy that are GMO products. So you want to watch out for those things if you are buying packaged baked goods that are gluten-free at the grocery store. The other problem with a lot of these packaged gluten-free items is that they're very costly. I, you know, if you go to somewhere and you buy a package of gluten-free cookies, they can be anywhere from seven to ten dollars, and then you open the bag and it's like you get eight or ten cookies. <laughs> so, if you can make your own, if you can take the time to make your own, it is definitely more cost-effective. You know what is going into your baked goods and you can buy the best ingredients possible. Because you're eating these things on occasion, it's not something that you're cooking every single day. Hopefully you can find that extra hour to make a delicious baked good that's a little bit healthier for you. All right, so let's talk about how you're gonna do that. The first and easiest thing to do is to use your old recipes. If you have some tried and true recipes for say chocolate chip cookies or um, cupcakes and you know that it works every single time, absolutely use those old recipes but you're just going to tweak them a little bit and instead of using that regular all-purpose flour that you were using in the past, you're going to switch it for a gluten-free all-purpose flour mix. In this mix, you're going to mix together a half a cup of white flour, a half a cup of brown rice flour, a half a cup of sorghum flour, two-thirds of a cup of potato starch, and two teaspoons of sorghum. Make sure that all of these flours are organic. The two flours in here, sorghum and potato starch, are pretty difficult to find, at least in the area that I live in, at your local grocery store or food co-op. I do end up ordering them online. If you're part of a food co-op, you can actually ask them to order it for you. And I buy these things in bulk and then make big batches of them. So you're doing, you know, your time to do it by like 10, and then you have a big, nice batch of them that you can go into any time that you need it. There are some other pre-made mixes out there that you can start experimenting with. Unfortunately, the best ones that I found in the supermarket are not organic and they have that potato starch in there that ends up being uh, GMO and sprayed with glyphosate. And I don't really want that in my food at all. So I choose to make it instead. The other gluten-free flour mixes that are on the market, the pre-made ones that are organic, I have yet to find one in the last decade that I've been cooking gluten-free that I really like. This is definitely by far my most favorite one. Just a little thing about guar gum. So guar gum is the best additive that I like, but you can watch 
swap this out for a xanthan gum or arrowroot arrow as well if you are able to find those in your grocery store instead of guar gum. The xanthan gum is usually made from corn, so I'm not really a super big fan of that one. But whatever you can find, sometimes you just take what you can get. Okay, so this is going to be a one-to-one -one mix. So if you're using those old recipes that you like, or you find a new recipe, then just swap it out one-to-one. -one. So if you call for a cup of all-purpose flour, put in a cup of your all-purpose gluten-free flour bag. All right, so there's a whole bunch of different types of gluten-free flours out there. Rice, almond, oat, buckwheat, coconut, potato, sorghum, quinoa, millet, cassava, chickpea. And when you see these at the market, you may be asking, like, what, what on earth did I ever do with chickpea flour? And that's a really good question because there are some great uses for some of the flours listed in the bottom. But we're going to primarily focus on the ones at the top that have more of a multi-purpose use for them. All right, the first thing that we're going to be baking tonight is heavy bread. This is kind of my terminology for any kind of bread that has fruits or vegetables in them. Things like banana bread, carrot bread, zucchini bread, pumpkin bread. These are all great breads that you can bake a couple, put a few in the freezer for later. They really do well with either the one-to-one, -one, so any of these recipes, you can use that one-to-one -one all-purpose flour mix, that's the gluten-free one that we just talked about. You could stop right there and just never use any other gluten-free flour mix and make your life really easy. But I am gonna talk about some other flours that you can use that you can find at your grocery store because the sorghum and the organic potato starch is not always readily available and not everybody wants to go online and order flour. So in heavy bread, you can use rice flour with a combination of either oat flour or almond flour. So the rice flour is gonna give that bread that lightness that you want. And then the oat or the almond flour is gonna give it some moisture and some sticking power, power that the rice flour can't do. These are all flowers that you can find at your local grocery store. You don't need to go anywhere special for them. Also add an extra egg. That's gonna help bind that bread a little bit better than it would if you had had the gluten in it. All right, the next one is cakes and muffins. So cakes and muffins, typically we want those to rise and be nice and light. So using the one-to-one -one mix is the best for this because it's going to give you that light airiness. And make sure that you definitely add the flour gum, phantom gum, or arrowroot to that mix because it's going to give it that glutinous texture and risability that the gluten gives you in regular all-purpose white flour. Also, if you're making a recipe of either cake or muffin, that the batter is a little bit thinner and you can incorporate egg whites into them. Separate out your eggs, beat up the egg whites and fold them in regardless of what the recipe says. Most cakes are gonna have you do this anyway. Not all muffin mixes or batters are going to be good enough to be able to do it. But it's just another way give your um, baked goods a little bit more light, airy texture. Keep in mind that any of these recipes are going to be a little bit denser, sometimes a little bit greenier than you're used to, but it still tastes really delicious and it just takes a little bit getting used to. Another great tip to do is if you try any of these recipes and you think, I know this is definitely not for me, I cannot do this, then Get out your all-purpose flour that you've always been using and do half and half. So you can do half of the gluten-free flour mix, the one-to-one, -one, and half all-purpose flour. And it's going to add in the gluten that is going to give you the texture that you want. But you just now cut down the effect of the gluten by half. All right, cookies. Cookies are so easy to make because you can literally 
take any kind of flour, put it in a cookie, and it's going to work. One-to-one -one mix, super easy. You can just grab that mix and make up the cookie. Rice with almond or oat is going to work really well as well. And then you can do almond or oat alone. When you're making cookies that are gluten-free, make sure that you leave them on your cookie sheet after you stick them out of the oven for about two or three minutes, hard it up. If you move them right away, they are going to fall apart. So you don't want to have falling apart cookies. So just let them sit on your pan for a couple minutes and they will be just fine. Chickpea flour also works really well in cookies and that's kind of a fun flour to sneak in there and get some chickpea protein if you want. Rice flour by itself, I find that it makes a very crumbly cookie, although if that's the only flour that you have and you must bake cookies at that moment, it will work, they will taste really good, but be careful because they might be a little bit crumbly, crumblier than you would like. All right, bread. So bread is the trickiest of all to make. And if you don't have celiac, you just have a sensitivity to gluten or you would like to stay away from gluten because of the effect that it does have on your intestinal tract in your immune system, then sourdough bread is the closest to regular white bread that we're all used to. And it's easiest because if you can find an organic sourdough bread at your local grocery store, then that is super easy because you just buy the bread and bring it home. And it tastes really, really good. If you can find an artisan loaf of organic sourdough, that is better. Because the organic, well, the sourdough starter, not necessarily organic, depending on when it was started, um, the starter itself is much stronger and the practices of those artisan uh, bread manufacturers are going to be a little bit um, better about letting it sit around, letting it rise a couple times, and that starter eats the gluten in the process of making the sourdough itself. So that's kind of a neat one if you do have a sensitivity to it, to the gluten, then you can use sourdough bread instead. Still getting gluten bread, but without the gluten in the end product. All right, one-to-one -one mix if you're making any kind of bread, but there's a couple tricks here that will make it rise and be a better bread. Adding milk. So when you make bread, there's just a couple ingredients to bread, flour, water, yeast, and a little bit of salt, and usually some kind of lard like butter. But when you make the bread, if you swap out some of the water for milk, sometimes if I'm really desperate, I'll just take a scoop of yogurt or sour cream, whatever I have in the refrigerator, and get some kind of milk protein whipped up into your water so you have kind of a slurry of stuff. Any kind of dairy product into your bread, that milk protein is going to help your bread come together and rise better. The other thing that you can add into this whole mix of stuff is one teaspoon of baking powder. So however many times you um, make that one-to-one -one mix, so if you double or triple it, then do the same thing with the baking powder. So typically a loaf of bread is gonna call for anywhere from like five to six cups of flour. So you're gonna have to multiply that 20 times. And these two things are going to give you a much, much better rise in your bread. Typically, gluten-free flours, you want to just let them rise one time. If you punch it down and wait for it to rise again, a lot of times you run the risk that it's just not going to do that. So let it rise one time, throw it in the oven. It is going to be a bit heavier, denser bread than, say, a regular white flour or the sourdough but it's still pretty delicious. All right, pie crust. Gluten-free pie crust is so easy to make, but there is one tiny trick with this that is really, really important. Use the one-to-one -one flour mix. If you're in a pinch and you need to use a mix of the rice and oat, you can definitely do that as well. 
But when you make your pie crust and you cut in all of the butter into the pie crust, roll it out right away, put it into your pie shell and bake it. If you refrigerate the dough, when you take it out, because it doesn't have the gluten to give it the stretch and the pliability that you want to have, it's going to kind of fall apart and chunk it. And you're not going to be able to roll it out and you're going to be really frustrated. So just roll it out right away. The trick with pie crust though is that you want those little bits of butter still stuck in your pie crust intact and let them melt while it's cooking. So if you need to pop it back in the fridge for say five or 10 minutes, just let it harden up before you roll it out. You just don't want it too hard, just enough so that you don't melt that butter. So don't let it sit out on your counter. Make sure you have time to do it, roll it out right away, get it in the oven and bake it. Okay, the next one, hot pizza dough. Pizza dough is so much fun. Who doesn't like a good pizza? And this recipe I love because it is so easy to make. You make this right in your blender. You're gonna take one cup of olive oil, so you'll get a nice big dose of delicious fat, and then one cup of water, two cups of rice flour. You can use rice and almond meal if you'd like, but it's not gonna come out as crispy. A teaspoon of salt, blend it in the blender, and then you're gonna pour it onto a cookie sheet that has been um, oiled, and then bake it in the oven for 450 for 15 minutes until it's nice and crispy. Put your toppings on it, put it back in the oven until all the toppings have been melted and browned up a little bit, and well, I'll see next pizza. You can also do this in a big cast iron skillet. If you have, I think it's about a 12 inch skillet, this is great because it comes out round. All right, breakfast. Some things that we like to have for breakfast, things like waffles, pancakes, and crepes. Use the one-to-one -one mix, but this is another, this is a great place to use buckwheat. Substitute one-to-one -one in your recipe with buckwheat. So if you're, whatever recipe you're using, say waffles calls for all-purpose flour, just throw in the same amount of buckwheat. It will give you a denser product, but it definitely has much more flavor and a lot more nutrients and won't give you the effects of gluten. And if you can add egg whites into that mix, especially when you're making waffles or pancakes, it'll make it just a little bit lighter and fluffier. Crepes, you don't need to add the egg whites because you're not looking for a vibe product. All right, any of the things that we've talked about tonight, if you're looking for a specific recipe, I know we've talked about not using a recipe for everyday cooking, but when it comes to baking, recipes are really essential. And the joy of cooking is the go-to for any kind of recipe. And you can just swap out that one-to-one gluten-free -one mix for any kind of all-purpose flour that they call for in any of the recipes that you might have at home or grab yourself a copy of the joy of cooking. It's not only going to give you baking recipes, but it will also give you how to learn how to cook just about anything. All right, sugar. When you're doing any kind of baking, cut the sugar in half. Nobody will know. This is such a good trick to cut down on the calories, the blood sugar response that you're gonna get from those baked goods. And it just makes them a little bit healthier and nobody is the wiser. You can get a little bit um, braver and bring down the sugar even further until you can find it at a tolerance that you're able to work with. The more you're keeping sugar out of your diet, the more sensitive you're gonna to be to the taste of sugar. So even just a couple teaspoons and say muffins, it's still gonna taste really good to you. And then you can also substitute maple syrup and honey. So typically I would not suggest using maple syrup for honey because they are sugar products, but they do have a lower glycemic index and you can put those in your baked goods too and just help decrease the effects of the sugar. If, say, it's calling for a cup of sugar, you can put in a cup of honey, or you can cut that down to a half a cup, reduce the sugar even further. So those are some great tricks to just reduce the calories and the sugar content, any kind of baked goods that you're making, and make them a little bit healthier. All right, a little trick that I like to do, double batching. If you are spending all this time making whatever muffins or pizza crust or whatever it is, 
or anything else that you're baking for lunch, breakfast, dinner, make a double batch and freeze it. If you're making something like a stir fry, cut up the parts, separate out things that you would cook separately. So for example, the chicken, cut it up, put it in a Ziploc bag, cut up all the vegetables, put that into a Ziploc bag, and then dump it all into a big Ziploc bag and put it in your freezer. And on nights that you're low on time or you just don't feel like cooking, you can grab one of these things that you've already made in advance or one of the bags that has all the parts to make dinner and whip it up in no time. Another thing I like to do is to take leftovers and save them in single serving portions. And then it's like having an instant TV dinner at the ready whenever you need it. If you've got kids at home, this is really fun. You can just pick out you know, a whole bunch of them. Everybody can choose their favorites and you can pop it in the oven or on the stove top and reheat them. A little note about reheating any kind of food, don't do it in the microwave. Either use your stove top, toaster oven, or your regular oven. Putting food and heating it up in the microwave denatures the nutrients in the food itself. And the whole reason why you're eating it is delicious, but it's also giving your body the nutrients it needs to exist. So you don't want to do that and kill all those beautiful nutrients that you've worked so hard to get. All right, goals this week. We're not changing anything. I definitely am not suggesting that you start going to town, baking a whole bunch of gluten-free things, but it's a great way to make it a little bit healthier if you are making those baked goods at some point for the next special occasion. So everything stays the same this week. If you haven't gotten rid of all the sugar yet, work on that. If you haven't reduced the carbohydrates, work on that. If you have made it to a half a cup of carbohydrates every day, then start changing it out to things like buckwheat, quinoa, and brown rice. Just because it's gluten-free doesn't mean it's healthy. Remember this. All right, going forward this week, I want you to focus on who you want to be, how you want to feel and look. Do you want to feel better? Do you want to look slimmer? Do you want to fit into that bathing suit this summer? Whatever it is, close your eyes tonight and imagine where you want yourself to be and be feeling so that tomorrow you'll start taking the steps to get there. Stay positive and keep me moving forward.